Nigeria, the world's most populous black nation, holds a lot. Uh, talking about poverty capital of the world, despite enormous oil reserves and other mineral resources, Nigeria also has one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics states that four out of every ten people in the country's workforce are either unemployed or underemployed. Hello and welcome to Standpoint. I'm Ibrahim Sheeta. With me to, in the studio to discuss the Nigeria's unemployment scourge and its effect on the lives of the masses is the executive chairman of Eredo Local Council Development Area, Ekbe, Lagos, Adini Soliu. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you news. for having me. And let me start by reading out some of the statistics quoted by the uh, unemployment mm -hmm. statistics released by the MBS, which state that at least third quarter of 2018, Nigeria's unemployment rate stands at 23.1%, a figure that some scholars say it doesn't reflect the reality. But looking at all of the abundant resources in the country, does the, or do the Nigerian youths have any business being, being unemployed? Nigerian youths don't have any business being unemployed. From facts on the ground, there are no more resources. Right. There are, you know, farmlands for agriculture. The Nigeria is supposed to be rich, potentially at right. least. There is oil. There is stability, so to say, in the last, uh, at least since uh, the Civil War. So indications will continue to show that the Nigerian youth should at least by now be gainfully employed. But there are issues that won't make that happen when there is large-scale corruption in the country. There is serious gap in infrastructure development or mm -hmm. total decadence of infrastructure. Right. There is serious economic issues. There is lack of energy and electricity. So when you look at all of these things, it will become impossible for any government to create jobs. And security has become a major challenge as well. So investment is not thriving. So there is no nation of the world who is not engage in deliberate investment in the reset of the economy that will do well. <laughs> well, because if you're also, there are so many statistics all around there. Yeah. One of it is another saying, uh, the Washington-based Brookings Institution, you must have heard about this, that says Nigeria overtook India as having the largest number of people living in extreme poverty. And we are looking at a hoping 87 million people living in penury. So how do we find solutions to this? Nigeria has a large population, almost the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. But development is not at par with the growth in population. So, of course, the attendant result will be poverty growth in the country. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have in India too. India's population is explosive. Mm -hmm. So if development is not at par with increase in population, of course, you are asking for poverty. And poverty will grow incrementally. Uh, that is the issue. Now, what do you need to do as a government? One, we need to fix the economy. Two, we need to fight corruption. Three, we need to fight insecurity. And four, we need to start investing. Are you saying we need, we need? You're a member of the ruling party, so to speak. Yes. Uh, 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 do we just need, or are they already Let me doing tell that? you what, what has happened. You see, the problem that has you know, been pervading the country in the last 25 years, mm -hmm will not be solved in five years. I'm just talking about the civil rule. Before the advent of the current republic, you have had military, you had the republic before right. then. And there have been issues. There have been corruption since independence. There have been deliberate you know, neglect of our institutions and deliberate neglect of investing in education, in health, in energy. So all of the issues will come together to create the problem that we have now. Since the advent of the administration of uh, President Mohamed Buhari, a lot has happened, especially in the area of infrastructure. Roads have been built, hospitals have been built, there have been a lot of investment in education, schools have been built and innovated nationwide. Right. And there is a major war against corruption that has enabled us to save money and put in the real sector. Okay, let's quickly explore all of these opportunities that yeah. we have in this country and why we should have what people are talking about. Uh, it, it has been said that you also mentioned the issue of power yeah. as a problem yeah. in this country as well. So without power, it looks like there is nowhere, there is no, there is no way out anywhere. Yes, every nation of the world invests 
in power and they continue to improve on it. Because that's where you can be sure that both the people in the small scale, medium scale and large scale industry will try. The amount of money we spend in generating power and sustaining our businesses in Nigeria is enough to oil the business and create more businesses. So if you don't have power, it will become a general problem. Mm -hmm. And if you look at even those uh, foreign direct investors that come to the country, power is part of the considerations they will look at in determining the indices of whether they want to come to Nigeria and at the rate they want to do their business. And if you go to the telecommunications industry, for instance, the rate that we pay to make a call is one of the highest in the, in the world. Why? They will tell you because they are poor, there is a, a problem with power. Most of those telecommunications business spend a lot of money buying generators, buying diesel, dealing with All right. those, those, are, those, are still, those are still problems. But let us try to you know, bring it down. Let's domesticate All right. this issue. At least constitutionally, we have 774 local governments. Yeah. You know, there should be enough jobs created by these local governments. And then it's so uh, amazing that when people talk about government, they don't focus on the immediate government, which is the governments at the grassroots. Uh, the local government chairman, the local councils, etc. They only talk about the state government, particularly even the federal government. So why, uh, how much have uh, our local governments, you know, you know, doing to tackle, you know, these menace of unemployment? Well, the, the local government is doing a lot. And then you are local government, uh, local, <laughs> local government, government council look, government. People chairman. will generally have misconception of our government because of the way we have run our government in, in Nigeria. The federal government is usually a very powerful entity and in a way subsume, in fact, the state has, in most cases, the local government. So the people who ordinarily see just the federal government, and where you have state government that are very active up and doing, of course, you hear the names and right. you give them credit, they will know there's a state government that is touching the lives of the people. Now, uh, the local government, to especially in Lagos, right. are now they are up and doing. There are a lot of things that we do at the local government level to create jobs and energize the economy. Now, and this, the case is different from one local government to the other. It will depend on your capacity, on the kind of resources you are, that's available to mm -hmm. you, and you know, and the kind of you know manager at the ends of affairs of any local government. Right. So for me, priority is one. There are two ways you can, you know, be meaningfully engaged. You have to have education, right, and you have to have a skill. Um, Education, what are we doing about education? We're doing a lot of back to school. First, we need to ensure that their schools are there and they are functional. There are tools that the children can learn, the, the students and pupils can learn with. There are teachers in classrooms. And of course, the teachers are trained and understand what they should be impacting in the, in the, in the, in the I, students. I, I'd like to call in, and I want you to really buttress this for me. For instance, in your LCDA, you know, you sponsor about 250 indigenous yearly at you know, to actually and uh, to acquire different skills and act, you say, is born out of your own desire Absolutely. to reduce unemployment, to eradicate poverty and develop the community. So how much impact would you say these have had on the lives of your people? Absolute impact. You see, once you see a gap in human capital development, you have to feel it immediately. Because once you allow your youth to, to become idle, you are creating serious issues. Right. And you are going to have a lot of criminal society. So when we came into office, one of the things we found was that there were a lot of idleness among the youth, and we needed to arrest it. And we had to also do it in a way that's different from the usual rhetorics of empowerment. So what we did was to develop a program that would be able to train 250 you know, indigents of the area and make them independent and become employers of labor right. eventually. So we found a partner in NYC. Nigerian Industrial Opportunity Center in Uganda. It's been over 50 years in Nigeria, an internationally reputed organization. So we took the first set of 21 indigenous to the place. And they were there for six months. It was a resident program. Because we needed to also let the beneficiaries know that this, are, this is something they should value. So and our calculation was that if you stay in a place out of your house, uh, the comfort of your parents and mm -hmm. family and friends for six months, right. you will value it and be serious with it. So when they finished, we brought them back home, bought all their equipment for them, and gave them start of funds of 100,000 naira. It's not going to end there. We have also 
uh, uh, put together a committee of a monitoring committee that will ensure that the equipment we bought for them and the money we gave them will be put to good use. So in the next six months, we are going to be monitoring them until we are sure that they're able to stand fit on their own and they're able to also exist and create jobs and become the people we envisioned that they will become. Well, before, before we go on this um, short break, I, I just want us to also try to extend it, to broaden it and look at how, because issues, you are, you are doing some things, you know, in your LCDAs, trying to engage the youth so Absolutely. that at the end of the day, what you achieve is ultimate peace because if everyone is at, um, uh, employed, they, there will be peace in the land. But why do you think during election era, when politicians will always, you know, who are seeking elective positions will talk about remedying the state of unemployment, you know, slashing unemployment and all that. And when they get into office, something else is done. And they even slash the workforce, saying that it is over bloated. Why do we always have this? Yeah, maybe research is not enough. There's a different ball game between campaigning for office and coming into office to see the realities on the ground. So if you are a candidate for office, your first thing you should do is conduct a research know what you're talking about, understand what you are stepping into, ask questions. So that when you are putting it, your data on the table, there are things that can be verified. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So when you get there, what you have promised before you go to office will not be different from what you've been implementing. And you have to have focus and zeal and the political will to see through some of the all of the commitment that you made before coming to office. It takes a lot, but you have to be strong. There, you see, for politicians, there are a lot of issues when you get into a lot of interest that will distract you if you are not a focused and strong can, uh, character. And that's what I think everybody that is in leadership should be. Uh, so the fact that um, 250 indigents are, you know, being brought on, uh, you know, on board over time uh, is a result of your research? Yes. I've been in the area for a long time. I knew the issues. I schooled there. So I of, of course knew that creating employment, creating jobs, training, giving skills to the youth will right. change things. If we don't, you know there are in the two categories of youth. There are ones that are not uh, they are educationally disadvantaged. There are those that are financially disadvantaged. Uh -huh. So you identify them. Some are good, they are brilliant, they, they, but they don't have the right funding. Even that, you know what we did? We approached schools in the area. For instance, our collaboration with Atlantic Corp uh, uh, international school okay. produced scholarships to the, some of our indigent uh, students. Right. So, and we continue to collaborate with institutions like that that we can identify. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, you, you give us, um, shed more light on that as mm -hmm. soon as we come after uh, this break. Uh, let's go on a short break now. The discussion continues after now. You're watching Standpoints, and I've been discussing with the chairman, LCDA. Uh, Eredo LCDA, Adini Saliu, thank you so much for finding time much. to come on the program. Yeah, we were looking at how we can provide solutions to the rate, the spate of unemployment among the Nigerian youth. And then you've also read out how you've been helping the, the indigents or the natives or the residents in your own local uh, council development area. But then I want to know whether the xenophobic attack, you know, recent xenophobic violence in South Africa, which saw about one and many Nigerians returning back home and some still going to be coming back home maybe today or tomorrow and, and the like. Maybe one of your residents or people in your own community are also affected. And how do you view, you know, this xenophobic violence and how the federal government has taken care of well, it so far? Uh, uh, not that I know of so far, but I'm sure that there are people in my community that are there. And maybe they are not in the part where there are attacks. But, you know, for me, it is both ways. For, there shouldn't, no country should leave its citizens so frustrated to the point of thinking of defending themselves. So I think the government of South Africa and the South African police have failed the nation. If there are issues, the government should be able to rise to the occasion and the police too should be able to, you know, stand between, you know, two people who are about to face themselves in violence and, you know, the citizens of any country should be assured of justice. And if there are issues, they can report to the authorities. We also must encourage our Nigerian brothers and sisters that anywhere they are in the world, they are representing the country. They should be good ambassadors, 
and they shouldn't do any other that is inimical to the peace and law and order of that country. You are not subscribing to the fact that they say some of them are involved in drug peddling. No, no, what, I, so what I'm saying is that Nigerians everywhere should obey and live according to the law and order of the land they are. Mm -hmm. Now, in the country, our responsibility as a government is to ensure that our citizens feel safe everywhere they are and they should be able to count on us to defend them. So, create job creation in the country right. will reduce the tendency of the average Nigerian to go out to seek green pasture. That is not to say that people from countries can go, people can go from Nigeria to anywhere. There are Africans in the country that are also doing well, that are working. Some of us feel changed too, because there are jobs in Nigeria that South Africans are doing that Nigerians can do. So, there is a need for leaders internationally to come together and let their citizens understand that we need to cohabit. Right. That we need to live peacefully. Citizens of every country will need to also live by the law, order, and principles in the, their countries of residence. Let me have your perspective on these in line with um, what your LCDA is doing to tackle this space. Uh, some youngsters have great business ideas, but uh, they, they don't have access to loan. And at the end of the day, they bury the lofty ideas. How, how can they really be helped? No, we're going to look out for talent. And we're going to provide soccer for them. You know, there's a limit to what we can do as a government. You can't solve everybody's problem. But once we see somebody that's a star, we identify you and we look at how we can support you to do well. I just gave you an example of someone we gave scholarship, collaborating right. with Atlantico. Now, we on a daily basis look for other agencies that can support us in the work we are doing. So you find someone, there's an artist that came that we saw that you know was doing a good job, we encourage gave a scholarship to. And we also look for donor agencies to who can support some of these, you know, geniuses that we find in our society from time to time. And as a government too, we also invest deliberately. Because any every government must invest. You must invest in human capital. You must invest in infrastructure. So if you find people, talents in your community, invest in them, support them, because they are part of the riches of that society. I can see that you value what you can offer your nation, what Absolutely. you can do, which Absolutely. will definitely end you. Absolutely. But we live in a sort of nepotistic environment where if you don't know someone that knows someone, that knows anyone, you may not get the opportunity to be employed. Uh, so all of these things are also affecting people where professionalism is satisfied, uh, you know, to nepotism. Does that also occur in your SDA or...? It's a major challenge for leadership. It doesn't occur in my SDA. I don't do it. And it's not going to happen while I'm there. But it's a it continues to challenge leadership. Leaders of every nation, state, local government should understand that the people in that locality, right. they're not just your people. You have people who are voiceless. You have people who don't know anybody, who also are, are citizens of the country, residents of your local government, citizens of your state, and they need to be helped too. They also vote. They pay uh, uh, taxes, and they participate in the daily activities of the society. So you have to embrace the leadership spirit in you mm. to see everybody as equal before you and before the law, and treat everybody on the basis of merit. And that is what we do. We identify people who can do a job, we put them there. Whether you know someone or not, in any case, you don't have to know me. The 21 indigenous we trained, I did not know any of them. I didn't even recommend any of them. We had a process that you know, brought us up, and we sent them to training. And we, we, are, we, are coasting home. we are coasting home. And mm. I also want your perspective on these, which is very germane. Okay. In the Western world, for instance, the unemployed are placed on the door, which technically mean they receive what's called unemployment benefits. Yeah. Uh, so, which takes care of their basic needs. And so, so, since we practice borough democracy, why can't we also have that kind of a thing done in this country? Is it possible? There's because we have enough there, to... There's something the Vice President is doing, and, and that's helping a lot. A lot of it, you know, happened in the last quarter, and it's going to continue. Mm. You see, there are a lot of people in the country today, and government can't create jobs for everybody. What we need to do is to create an enabling environment for job creation to happen. So the intervention that the government needs to do is what the vice president has been anchoring in the last one year or so, and that will continue. 
and with time it will be institutionalized. You have empire projects ev everywhere, right. and you have all these uh, money, ten thousand naira that vice president goes to the market to get. So that's something for people who really didn't think that they had that kind of circle, and that's be happy. And the report that got back from even the, the state that vice president has visited has been very positive. So it's not different from what you have in the U.S. Right. Okay, well, uh, we are actually taking it home. So, finally, by 2020, uh, it's projected that Nigeria's unemployment rate will hit 33.5%. So, what short-term measure can the, the, the government you know, deploy to stem this tide? The government has announced that they're going to uh, bring a number of people out of poverty in the next 10 years. Yeah. Now, there's, I told you about Empower, there's an right, borrower right. scheme, there's a number of other schemes that the government has put in place. One, that's one. Two, the government is fighting corruption. Three, they are investing in the economy. There's a lot of investment in infrastructure, a lot of the light rail project, control of major roads. Just this morning, it was announced that about uh, several billions have been released to construct about 10 uh, roads, you know, across the country. Right. So all of that infrastructure, investment in infrastructure, are going to galvanize opportunities and employment. So. I don't believe in the statistics that says, and again, they are diversifying the economy. There's a lot of investment in agriculture now. Right. So the statistics that says that it's going to increase is a bit shaky for me. With this kind of effort that the current administration of President Buhari is putting in place, I think that we're able to reduce the tide from the 23.1 uh, unemployment rate, it should come lower. And the 20.1 unemployment rate should also reduce. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, also for sharing insight in what is happening in your LCDA and also what should also be uh, adopted by other local council development chairmen or Thank local you, government uh, development areas. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Executive Chairman, Eredo LCD, Adini Salih. Thank, Thank you so much for coming to Standpoint. Yeah. And that's our package on today's edition of Standpoint. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can watch a repeat of this edition by 7.30 p.m. and tomorrow by 7.30 a.m. I'm Ibrahim Shita. Bye now.